Okay, welcome to the Spine Conference. Today we're going to discuss a real case a couple weeks ago of eoatrogenic spondylolisthesis. So if you have any questions, just interrupt me. So this, you can't see the top, but um, this man is a 51-year-old man uh, who presented um, uh, to uh, another surgeon uh, with um, low back pain, basically. And uh, this is his pre-op uh, pre MRI before he had the surgery. And he presented to me six weeks post-op from another surgeon's surgery because he had terrible sciatica and he wanted a second opinion. And why does he have this terrible pain? And um, he's a renal transplant patient. Uh, he has gout. He's a big guy, 5 feet 11, 220 pounds. Uh, he's 53 years old. So this is a sagittal cut of the MRI. It's pre-op MRI. So any... Any comments or questions or so you can see at L four oh five hold on. L four oh five is this that's not this far. Um not terrible. Right there. Mm -hmm. And otherwise um spine's pretty normal. It's um no spondylolisthesis, everything's lined up and the, the disc kites are well maintained. And Again, this is a pre-op, um, not much, not, it's just a mild L405 disc bulge. And then this is more sagittal cuts. This is like, and I, I call this like parasagittal cut because it's not in the midline because you can see this is the midline. You can see the posterior spinous process right there. So kind of looks like the top of a dinosaur's back. I forget which one. But this is not in the midline. You can see the frame in this stenotic there. It should look like the one above it. See how the nerves compress there? So this is his pre-op. And an axial cut pre-op, uh, the spinal canal has a triangular shape. And it should be circular. And this is at the level of uh, L405. And this is due to um, usually three things. A bulging disc, broad-based bulging disc, hypertrophy of the ligament of flavum, which is the black stuff near the facet, and also the, the facet's um, enlargement. In this case, the facet's not that enlarged. And here's another view of the uh, axial cut, just one millimeter, a couple millimeters down. And this is L5S1 pre-op. This is interesting. It's got a lot of fat in his spinal canal. See that? And um, I'm, I'm not sure what that means. But it, I mean, it, it, I guess it can uh, compress the nerve roots. So the patient had a um, basically L4 laminectomy. So that's an L4 laminectomy. And you can see the whole lamina is taken off. And that should decompress the nerve roots fully. But the patient said post op, his pain got worse and he had sciatica. And he said he did terrible. And, um, he called the office of the other surgeon who ordered an MRI due to the severity of symptoms, and this is the post-op MRI. So what do you guys think of the post-op? Any comments at all? You don't have to have. I can just keep going unless you want to say something. What do you think? The disc is still there. Yeah, the disc is bulging. It's a little worse, though, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. there's the defect. That's where the laminectomy was done. So the laminectomy was done on the right area. But the disc looks even worse, right? A little odd, don't you think? And here's a parasagittal cut. And here the framing looks even worse. You see the, I'll show it to you. Right there, it's even, the framing's even worse. Um, but nothing dramatic. Here's another parasagittal cut. Oh, the other interesting thing is the pars. So my arrow, is on the pars right here. And you can't really tell if it's broken or not. It does look a little bit weird. It's like black, but, but you can't, it's hard to say what's going on with the pars area. Here's another pair of sets that'll cut. So I just put these next to each other. Here's pre and post-op. So which in, what's, what's interesting is, come in. Let's see. Hey, good morning. Sorry. No, no problem. Made it back from across the pond? No, no there. just Delaware. Just across state lines. Yeah. Okay. So, um, 
this is um this is a case of a uh let me bring you up to speed it's gonna have to be quick though this is a man who had low back pain sciatica uh mri shows just some bulging disc there david and um axial cuts show stenosis the spinal canal is a triangle and so l405 stenosis and he underwent a laminectomy uh stand pretty standard stuff but he come but post-op he had terrible sciatica pain and just the post-op mri i didn't do the first surgery post-op mri shows a large the disc got larger um and um kind of the same so this is this is where we are now so the pre-op and post-op the disc is actually a lot larger post-op and there's a reason the reason i'm going to tell you the reason now post-op he developed spondylolisthesis real bad and i'm going to show you the x-ray so you can imagine i think what happened in this case and i've never seen this before but i, I may be stretching the truth here but i'm trying to make a I always try to make a story out of things like why are things so I think what happened post-op, he got spondylolisthesis because he had a pars fracture and it stretched the disc. You can just imagine in your mind that L405, the disc slide, the bone sliding forwards and it stretches the disc. And then when he lays down for the MRI, this whole thing bunches up. And that's why it looks like that. So, so it's, he didn't really herniate a disc, but rather now he has a deformity of his spine. And the disc is stretched at L4, L5. And that's why it has that appearance. Um, so this is um, just an axial cut. And you can see now the, um, the fecal sac is open. And there's this, um, the, the white stuff behind the fecal sac is just fluid that's kind of natural post-op. Huh. See fecal sacs open, fecal sacs totally open. Um, fecal sac is open. Um, and um, there's this fluid behind it, which is this post-op. And this is a axial cut at the level of a foramen. And I thought, I didn't have an x-ray pre-op because he just showed it to my office without an x-ray. I thought maybe he just had a foraminal disc here. I, 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 didn't, I didn't know why he was having such pain. And I think the other surgeon wasn't sure either because it looks like he's opened up. Because um, the MRI looked benign. And here's L5-S1. Before there was a lot of fat there, now there's no fat. So I think the fat, he took, during the decompression, the fat went away. So before, basically I always get x-rays and I usually think it's a total waste of time to get these x-rays because they're usually normal. But this is a case where the x-ray shows everything and, and the MRI doesn't, which is usually in the opposite. And, and patients sometimes get angry, they say, I don't want an x-ray, I want an MRI because an MRI will tell me what's wrong. Not always true. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's obvious, wow, it's, now I know exactly what's going on. He has post-op spondylolisthesis. In fact, I'm gonna show you a little later. The AP view shows everything. It's sliding to the side and you can see the, uh, the laminotomy defect. And, and you can see the fracture. If you look carefully, here's the spondylolisthesis flexion extensions. You can see now he's, he's shifting a lot. So you can imagine he's that shifting. He's yeah, he's got a fracture, right. And I'll show you the fracture on the AP. So if you blow it up, that this is broken. So um, it's an interesting case where just, just uh, I mean, he was recent post-op and he, they jumped right to the MRI, but the, 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 uh, the point is you need both. And sometimes you need three. You need an x-ray, a CAT scan, and an MRI because the CAT scan clearly shows the fracture. Uh, and the MRI does not. In fact, the MRI, I couldn't see it at all. So you would think the MRI is the best study, but it's not for fractures and for cortical bone problems. So any questions so far before I keep going? Okay. So, yeah, it's interesting. So he had sciatica. So this is... I, I, he had a surgery. He was he was in horrible pain, and the surgery. Uh, these are just my notes. So after every surgery, I I draw myself my own notes just so I know what I did. It's kind of like my own notebook, and um, just this says to me. Well, basically the surgery was two and a half liters of IP fluids, 850 cc's of blood loss, which is a lot actually for this case. It's usually like 500, 
And I think the, the reason is he just bled for whatever reason and more than usual. And uh, he was a big guy. So it just made the surgery a little more difficult. I mean, not terrible amount of blood, but more than usual. 300 cc's urine output. It took 2.75 hours, which is about right for this type of revision surgery because I really had to open the nerve root. And you can see here, these are my notes that said to myself, I really opened up this nerve root well, and this was the problem. And, um, and the X's are the screws and the uh, lines of the rods. It just shows where I put the bone graft posterior laterally. And this little, this little rectangular thing says I took right posterior iliac crest bone graft. And the side view is just um, what it looked like post-op, the screws and what levels I did. And the screws that I used, I used the pew. So um, I just kind of like make, make notes to myself so I know what I did. And here's the post-op x-rays. Um, which shows he's reduced, but the re reduction, uh, it, look, it looks great. I mean, reduction was mostly just done by the table, uh, but I did open up that frame and on the right because um, uh, that was his chief complaint was um, right sciatica. If you look at the, uh, let's look at the, the AP, you see how it's kind of closed down on the right, and, uh, and that was sort of the problem. So post-op, I just, I just threw the screws and just distracted it a little bit and gave, the nerve doesn't need that much room. It needs usually like two or three millimeters of room. So you just open that up and the nerve's got room. Um, and the problem is the framing is the most painful part of the nerve root because that's where the dorsal root ganglion is, the DRG. So when that's crunched, it's really, really painful. So, and the patient did great. His pain, then the next day he said, I feel better already, even though he had this big fusion. Next day, he said, I feel better already because his nerve root was released. So I thought that was an interesting case of uh, spondylolisthesis. So I just wanted to go over just a couple of things. Spondylolisthesis, there's six different types as categorized by Wiltsy, who was a um, very prominent surgeon in California. Um, dysplastic, which is when children get it, children get a parse fracture and they get very deformed. This is the dysplastic one, you can see. Isthmic, which is a pars fracture. Degenerative, that's when it slides through the facets. Traumatic is when you get a pars fracture from like a car accident, usually. Pathologic is sometimes tumor erodes the pars and they slide. And iatrogenic, and we'll go over iatrogenic um, doctors call spondylolisthesis. And, and there's different types of decompressions. The one on the left is what I usually do is a, a unilateral approach, bilateral decompression through like a hole. And that keeps most of the structures intact, the interspinous ligament, posterior spinous process. The other side is mostly open. The facets on the opposite sides intact, basically. So, but I have had instability after my technique, too, you know, a lot of laminectomy biology compression. I've had instability, too, but I think it's dramatically less than full laminectomy. So full laminectomy is the top right and uh, like a, a porthole is on the left, right? We won't go over that. So this is the article that I sent everyone it's from it's the most recent article on uh, iatrogenic spondylolisthesis, and it's from Hopkins. Um, and um, basically, they reviewed 105 laminectomies, and these are just straight laminectomies with no complicating factors like a uh, discectomy or tumor or frag, you know, you know, straightforward laminectomies with no stability pre-op, no on flexion extension views, totally stable. And in their series of 100 laminectomies, 10% developed spondylolisthesis, and which is kind of high, I think. And um, it usually it was about almost two years, 19 months later, and then they had the surgery about two years later. And the risk factors were if they removed a lot of facet with the initial surgery, if you had multiple levels of laminectomy, and the taller the disc height you're slightly more likely to develop spondylolisthesis, maybe because there's a lot of motion. Um, and L405 is particularly at risk. So this man was L405 too. Um, and the literature rate is one to 32%, it was very variable. And the Hopkins rate was 10%, which is probably about right. And this is just another article that I didn't say, this is from, I pulled this up last year, but uh, this was a meta-analysis meta of spondylolisthesis following decompression, and um, post-op instability was five percent. Um, if 
so and about 12% for post-op is submitted for open laminectomy. So it's the same as Hopkins. Um, this is from Neurosurgery Focus 2015. So I just wanted to show you guys how I think the best way to do decompression without destabilizing. So the pars, the pars in articularis is right here. Um, and you don't want to fracture that. If you if you fracture, so here's the pars. If you fracture the pars, that's what happened to this guy. And you just don't want that to happen. So how how do you how do you do the technique? So you don't fracture the part. So this is how I do my technique for my approach with unilateral laminectomy bilateral decompression. And you can see I drew out the facets on the top are the posterior spinous processes. The head of the patient is to the left. The foot of the patient is to the right. Um, these things are the uh, transverse processes here. Um, so this is what you see during the surgery. And we're going to go over a surgery. Um, so the next thing I do is you can see the dots are pedicles. So in my mind, I imagine where's the pedicle in this patient? And the reason why I want to find the pedicle is I know the pedicle is where the nerve root is. And the nerve root is usually the lateral border uh, of the facet. I mean, lateral border of the dura. And so next step is you think about that in your mind. And um, so then the dotted line is where the dura should be. So if you, these things are, I mean, obviously it's real hard and it takes a long time to uh, learn the, these mm -hmm. techniques, but, but that's life. Like it's just, you, you slowly learn these uh, things as a surgeon to do a good job. So you imagine where the dura would be. So then uh, you imagine where the top of the ligum flavum would be. And that's the top of the ligum flavum is much higher than the bottom of the lamina. So that's the bottom of the lamina. And the, the ligament of flavum attaches way higher. So you want to remove all the ligament of flavum. So to remove all the ligament of flavum, you have to make a window by removing the bone. Okay, does that make sense? Sort of. I know. I wish I could make it more clear. We're going we're gonna to go over the surgery, and then um, you'll have time to ask questions there. Um, so the, the, this line, this new line, is my cut. So I make an initial cut with the burr, and that's the hole in the lamina. And you can see that will remove all the ligamentum flavum. And you want to keep the area for the pars as wide as possible. So this is the pars area. You don't. So if you if you remove more bone, you make the pars skinnier, more likely to fracture. So basically, you want to take the least amount of bone to open up the dura, so you don't weaken the spine. Um, and then the next step is you want to, the yellow is ligament of flavum. You want to take all that off. But first you take all the bone off because the ligament of flavum actually protects the dura because it's over the dura. So you remove all the bone that you think you need. And sometimes you don't know how much bone you have to take, you need, take, but you just guess. And then you take the ligament of flavum. The way you take the ligament of flavum is on the top and on the bottom where there's the most um, area for the spinal canal, you find the dura. And then you peel off the ligament. So I think if you do it in, in, this, in these steps, it decreases the probability of instability. Now, it took me 20 years for me to understand these steps. And sometimes I was doing things that I didn't know why I was doing them. Um, but I think that's life. OK, so now we can ask, we can ask a lot of questions here because we're going to go over uh, the surgery itself. So this is the same thing I just drew. So the top is medial. So now, so you can see the burr. The burr is three millimeters. And um, so to give you an idea, that this line right here is the facet. Now, this is a case of a fusion. So I took all the cartilage off the facet to make it diffuse. And, and, uh, but when you do just a decompression only, obviously it's not a fusion. You don't see all that. But I did this, I made this video Tuesday because I knew I was going to have this conference. So I just wanted to, uh, I thought even though it's a fusion, you still, it's a decompression just like you would otherwise, and you get the uh, an idea of what's going on. So I wouldn't measure from the very middle to the pars area, to the facet, how much distance it is. And I was having a hard time uh, <laughs> getting the rule just right. But see, that's in dead, dead center middle, and then to the facet is 15 millimeters. So this gives you an idea of the of the size, and you can measure uh, things 
under the mic scope with your burr because you know the burr stream that we use. So this is my first cut. My first cut is where I think the dura is. And usually you leave about five millimeters for the facet. See, see the, see I'm leaving five millimeters right here of the facet so I don't fracture the facet. And I'm curving it over to the top where I think the top of the ligament flavor should be. Um, and I think it's like halfway up the lamina in general. So when I do this step, I mean, so the fear, the fear is this burr hits the dura and causes a CSF leak. Right? You don't want to cause a CSF leak or injure the nerves. But I know the ligamentum flavum is deep to the bone. So it, it's a, it protects you. Mm -hmm. So that's why this step is sort of a little bit with reckless abandon. Although at the very top, you can't hit the dura because, again, remember the ligamentum flavum ends at the top. So deep to that is just dura. So at the top, you have to be careful. So, um, so I keep thinning, and then that curette is to feel how, how thick I am. Um, because, um, see, I'm, I'm feeling, see, it's pretty thick. See that? It's probably like, still like three or four millimeters thick. So I'm saying to myself, hmm, okay, this is you know, this thick. If it's real thick, it means more burr. If it's kind of thin, I can use the kerosene. So if it's like, I guess it's like three millimeters or less, I can use the kerosene. So then with the kerosene, I remove the rest of the lamina. And again, this, this step I can do fast because deep to the kerosene is ligamentum flavum, which is protective. And things will make more sense in a little bit. So this step takes a little bit of time. So this step is basically removing, remember I said I expect curved area that I'm going to expose all the dura? This, this is removing the, all the bone in that curved area to open up the uh, dura. So the difference between <clears throat> this technique and the open laminectomy is this big bone in the middle, that's posterior spinous process, that's totally removed in a uh, full laminectomy. And there's all and all the musculature, this is only one side of the spine. So the other side of the spine is, no, is normal. So all the muscles, everything, all the attachments are left in place. So I think that cre decreases the chances of uh, post-op instability, but it's not zero. So, so I'm just see, I'm just removing removing bone slowly, and that at the very top is where, where you find the dura. So that's why I don't I don't do a lot of that in the, in the beginning. I leave that for the end. So this is I'm just basically I'm removing all the bone from my hole, and I'm 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 trusting that I was right with my cut. But what I do is a little game with myself every case. Is I see how perfect I can be in my cut, my initial cut, and then I and then I criticize my cut with Aaron, and then I say, was it, was it my assistant, I said, what do you think of my cut today? And she's usually she says it's right, dead, dead perfect, because I'm usually dead perfect. But sometimes it's too much. Sometimes I remove too much bone, and sometimes I remove too little bone. And we, so it's just I, this is just go. This will take a little time. This this whole video is 25 minutes. So, but I, I thought it's. I thought it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm through. See that? And I'm I'm mostly most of the bone's gone now. And 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 this is lig this is a uh, hold on, let me show you. This is this is the ligament of flavum. Okay, that's step one. These are in um, five minute increments. So the the uh, the uh, computer on the microscope, when it records things, it records them in five-minute increments. I don't know if you guys are interested in that. So, so this is a, so I keep removing bone, 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 mm -hmm. and yeah, kerosene, yeah, 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 hand, yeah, just squeeze. Mm -hmm. It's like a gun. You squeeze it. And it's the, the under part is really soft and smooth. And whoever designed the kerosene, it was a genius because it's an, it's an incredible instrument. And it's smooth and it, it almost never cuts the dura. And the dura is paper thin. The, the thickness of the dura is like a couple millimeters. So this thing is really well designed. I don't know. I tried to look it up who kerosene was and who designed it. I couldn't find out. 
but whoever did this, I mean, is an amazing human being. I mean, I, I wish I could do something like that in my lifetime. I probably never will to help people. So it's just it's just moving along and just this step is just still removing bone here and that that's a little bit of the said it's, it's just too thick for the kerosene and I just have to thin it down so that it's thin mm -hmm. enough and again I'm, I'm safe because I haven't exposed so I feel well, sometimes I, I work with the kerosene but I keep feeling to see how thick I am whether I can do this with the kerosene and there, that's the top of uh, the laminate below. So I'm peeling off the ligament and flavum, but not fully yet. Because I want to leave the ligament and flavum to the very end because it protects the dura. And that's a pituitary, just removing some of the ligament, <laughs> basically, so I can see. And the, and the basic technique in spine is you pull away from the dura. So you don't, you don't want to push towards the dura. Everything is pulling it away. Mm -hmm. Pituitary, yeah. Because it was designed to go in the brain. Yeah, yeah. Take a pituitary, yeah. It's like, it's basically the same thing that people use as a grabber when they can't bend down to pick up trash in their homes. It's mm -hmm. the same, it's the same thing. Just more delicate. So, things are going to get more interesting in just a couple more minutes. But there I'm feeling the top of the lamina above. And that, see that's, now I'm gaining access to the spinal canal. I'm maybe thinking about it. It's beautiful. Don't you think it's a beautiful picture? It's, um, it's the Leica 6 microscope. Yeah, it's really good. It's, a, it's an improvement from the last microscope, the last version. So now I've, dec I've decided I'm going to take away the ligament and I'm pulling it. I think that's thorough on the top right there. Yeah, it's got like a shiny. So I grab the ligament and then I peel it off with the curette. And, and that's the safest way to work around nerves is to just constantly uh, pulling away from the nerves. You don't want to go into the nerves because then they damage them. So basically you lift and then I, I peel it off with the curette. And the curettes, see that stir right there? See the nerve, the blood vessels on top of the dura? So all that was really hypertrophic pushing on the nerves. Yeah, and it shouldn't be that thick. It should be like, yeah. And see how it's just pulling all that stuff off of the dura. You can see all this ligament of flavum was protecting the dura while I was doing the burning portion. So that's why you just want to leave it intact until the very end. So this step is just now I've, I've exposed most, I have a good, I have a good view of the dura. Uh, and then when you have a good view of the dura, you know where it is in your mind's eye. And it makes the surgery easier to protect the dura because you know where it is. And now I can use the kerosene more aggressively to remove the ligament of flavor because I know where the dura is. But there's some cases where I don't see the dura for a really long time. And I'm always a little nervous because I don't know where it is. I mean, I know where it is in my mind, but I like to see it. Okay, we're getting there. There's only five of these, so. So now I'm going centrally a little bit over the canal. Just to, and the reason I'm going central is I need a, I need space for my kerosene to get into. Because uh, I need a three millimeter hole because it's a three millimeter kerosene. So I just keep making more space around the dura so then I can get that last bit. Once I can get my whole kerosene in there, I can get that last bit. So now I have a big enough area needed. Yeah, so I just keep chipping on. See, all that stuff where the sucker is, it's just hypertrophic capsular tissue and ligament of flavor tissue pushing in on the nerves. Now you can see, see the door is pulsating now? A little bit? Oh, maybe not. 
We'll see you in a second, hopefully. If you can see the dura pulsating, you know you're you, 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 you know you're getting decompressed because it has, now it has room to pulsate. And then this is the other technique. You see how my sucker's right on the uh, dura. Mm -hmm. So th this is those those uh, that suction is plastic, and it's it's very soft and malleable, unlike like a metal sucker thing. And it's long, and it's see how it's long and it's thin. That makes it even bend even more. So you can see now the dura is getting. That's a nerve root. It's getting fully decompressed. I like to use the sucker as a uh, manipulated instrument of the nerve roots because it's soft, it's malleable. And it, I never injure the nerve roots with the soft uh, sucker tip. And this sucker tip, it's it's actually a cardiovascular sucker tip. Sucker tip. So I, I basically I do the whole case myself at this point. Just push, see how I pull, I pull aside the nerve roots and then use the kerosene. I think it's better than having your assistant pull on it because your assistant has a tendency to pull too much. And uh, and I always let it go. I just pull it enough to get my instrument in, then I let it go. So I don't I don't call it. See, I'm pulling it and then I let it go. See that? And then I I pull, I let go. And the the whole point of that is you're not always retracting the nerve. If you're always retracting the nerve, it's giving it a wide open appearance. I mean, sure, you can see better, but then you cause a nerve injury. And if you cause a nerve injury, um, it, it frequently is permanent. So there's no comeback to that. So that's why it's beneficial to use, I think, these soft uh, uh, sucker tips and just do transient retraction. So I, I almost never have my system retract the nerve roots, which is kind of like the standard thing to do. But... I feel this is much better for the patient. So now I'm in the lateral recess, and see now, see how the dura now goes right up against my bone. See how you see the, can you see the medial board of the, the dura? Like that? See that? Hold on. That's the medial board of the dura. You see that? And when I let go, now I'm I'm almost fully decompressed. You can see the dura goes right up into my cut. See that? So my cut was perfect. And now it's, I'm undermining the uh, lateral recess. Take all the ligament flavin and capsule to set off to fully open the fecal sac. And the penfield, that's a penfield pour that kind of like sweeps, just sweep any adhesions off the dura that may be present. And then, you know, if you don't do that, you can get a spinal fluid leak. So now so you, can see, you can see the big hole in the nerve is so great. Uh, that's the nerve root coming off right there. That's mm -hmm. a, right, my my pointer right there. I need to get a new pointer. It's on the, this lateral, the most lateral portion of the dura is where the nerve roots exit. So now, yeah. now I'm going to the opposite side of the spinal canal. So I did my side, the left side. Now I'm undermining the posterior spinous process on the other side, and I'm going to decompress the other side of the spine now. First, I have to thin it down. So I can remove it with the kerosene. So I'm going to the opposite side of the patient now. And I didn't expose anything on that side. All the muscles, everything above it are all intact. I'm just opening the spinal canal. It's like a little wax. So you'll see, you'll see at the end of this, I decompress both sides of the spinal canal from just the one unilateral approach. Oh, and the most important thing is the pars is kept intact. So this is the pars right here. So it's very important to keep the pars, this is the pars, to keep the pars intact. If you don't keep the pars intact, you get a fracture in the spondylolisthesis. So this is So you see I'm creating a bigger hole. It's basically, you're going to be able to see all the dura at the end through a one-side approach. It's the same. It's the same principle with the sucker. As I push the nerve roots down uh, with the suction tip, and not a lot, just enough to get my instrument in. You see how the how the sucker is the retractor, and then I let go. I always let go, so it's, it's not excessive traction.
So I don't know if you can tell, but now the fecal sac is starting to look normal now. That's what it should look like. It should look like a, like a circle. Yeah, it's, it's, it's opening up. Yeah, it's opening up like where it should be. Sometimes, sometimes the fecal sac has been compressed so long that it does not resume its normal shape. And it still looks bent because it had been bent for so long, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah, but then over time, it does stretch and open up. But when that happens, I'm always worried, is, like, you know, is there some kind of adhesion or something that I need to remove to make it look normal? Sometimes there's adhesions on the dura that do that. So this is kind of now near the end now. Now I'm going, now I'm, that's the opposite side of the spinal canal. And I'm undermining the opposite side from, from the opposite side of the table without doing a full laminectomy, just one side of laminar front line. You can see really well. I mean, and, and it's the, the biggest complaint about, the biggest uh, criticism of this technique is you can't see well and you don't decompress as well. I think that used to be true with loops, but now with the new microscopes, that's not true. And you can see just as well uh, uh, with this approach with the microscope as you can with the open approach with loops. It takes some practice, though. So there's a learning curve. Someone was done here. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay. And that's the top of it. So, so any questions about laminectomy and the technique? And this is just the, I probably don't have to do this step right here because essentially it's open, but the problem with being a surgeon is um, you get obsessed with perfection which is good in one sense, and it can be bad in the other if it, goes, it becomes excessive. But, but I, oh, huh? That's the whole point. Some people go crazy over this. Like, they lose their insanity with perfection, and they, and they, they cause harms, and they can't stop. You know, they keep obsessive with perfection. So that's like, that's a problem we all have as human beings, is, is, is judgment. Um, because the longer you take, the more times this instrument goes in and out, the higher the probability you'll injure a nerve. Also, the longer the patient's on the table, mm -hmm. and their face is up against a pillow, it's a prone position, it's a fluid shift. I mean, you, you want it to be, you want it to be sort of quick if you can. Mm -hmm. Every everything, everything. You just don't want to spend a long time. So it's a it's a it's a real balancing act. I mean, I think so in my mind. But on the other side, there's this incredible drive that you have to be perfect uh, and do the, the best possible job you can. It's hard. I think it's it's life. It's like a balancing act. So that's the very. I mean, that has to come out. But that's the very edge of the opposite side. You see, I'm, I'm pushing down with the suction tip pushing the dura and catching that capsule there. You can see it very clearly, actually. The fully, and, and then when you're done, the dura has a round shape. So it goes from triangle to round. The triangle to circular. You can see, you can see that it's pulsating. You, look, you see that? And you see how the kerosene's round, it just, it scoops, um, it pushes the dura itself. This is the last video, there's a couple on that. You gotta get underneath and take all that capsule looking on the plane off from the opposite side. I, I think two microscopes ago, it wasn't as easy. This is the fifth. This is the fifth, uh, the sixth round microscope. It used to be the microscope where, where these big machine that you couldn't move. You just set it, and then it wasn't. Hard, it was hard to see, and the, it was hard to see how it's pulsating now. And this is the very last, this, like this very last bit. And the, the other thing is the dr the drill can kick 
the, the sucker is between the dura and the drill. So if I hit anything, I'm going to hit the sucker and not the dura when I retract the, the, the sucker. I usually pick the side that hurts. So if the patient says I have more left side than right side pain, there's more on the left, I go to the left. Sometimes though, uh, it's it's uh, obvious on the MRI that the right's worse than the left, like one side's worse than the left, so I go with the MRI sometimes. Usually the symptoms though, because when patients wake up, they want that they want their pain gone. So that's got to be your, just got to be your focus. It's, it's whatever the pain the patient has, remove it and not treat the MRI, but treat the patient. So it's usually just pick the symptom side. So this is the very, very last bit on the opposite side. So any questions about the technique? ULBD, unilateral laminectomy by arm decompression. ULBD. ULBD? Yeah. So, I, I don't know how many people are really interested. Some surgeons think this is a total waste of time. And it, it's no different than the standard technique. I think the, I think the reason is it's it's uh, it's just hard to get good at it. The, it takes time to get good at it. Yeah, and be able to yeah. Yes, that's the whole point. So you don't have to do fusions. So, I mean. The driving force for fusions also is that it, it pays more for everybody involved. It pays more to the surgeon, it pays more to the hospital, it pays more to the implant corporations, no offense, Tony. But, but um, so that's why there's a big uh, motivating force to do more fusions than not. And the, the, the percentage of fusions in the United States has gone up tremendously. Like, I don't know, 10 times, and people don't know why. They think it's maybe more no surgeons. I don't know. You think decompression is better? I mm. I, I agree. And the other the other nice thing about doing these decompressions is the people are just so happy. And they do this do so well. There's they're, they're small cases. They go home the next day. They don't have much pain. Um, I mean, some people need fusions. Don't get me wrong. But as long as there's no instability, this is a better procedure. And uh, it's rare. Like a uh, spondylolisthesis after this type of decompression is rare. So you see now that the fecal sac is wide open. Yeah. That's it. So any um, so any questions about decompression, spondylolisthesis? How large Corn is that? 250, he probably looks something like Tony. A little less muscular than Tony. But something like Tony. Not a huge guy, but not a small guy. Um, that's why the surgery is a little more difficult. Because the people people that look more like offensive linemen versus like, I don't know, divers or something, it's thin. They have big midsections and they have a lot of muscle there. It just makes the surgery more difficult because it's deeper. They have deeper, more muscles to push aside. Yeah, just to, and that takes longer operative time, more bleeding. And the lower down, the harder it is. So, like T12, L1 of the big guys, pretty easy. But L5, S1 is a real struggle because it's just deeper in the body, uh, and it's you're just thicker there. There's more muscles. Mm -hmm.
Sunday. The kids are not writing on stuff from the last two weeks. Why would you? How do you deal because with it? We're talking about the second Sunday and the third Sunday. Right. There, you know, there's a big, like multiple surgeries. There, you know, there, there's a thing about spine surgeries that people expect you have one spine surgery and then you'll never have another spine surgery in your life. Like everything's fixed. But that's not how, that's not how it works because the spine is many, many, many bones and many, many, many joints. Uh, and some people just keep deteriorating. For example, me, I'm not here to talk about me, but I had one bad disc 20 years ago. Now I have like three bad discs and I'm just, as we get older, we deteriorate. It's yeah, it's a progressive deer. Just like the heart. One year you have one vessel's clotted. Next year, another vessel's clotted. Five years later, four vessels clotted. I mean, things deteriorate. So same as the spine. So I think to think that you can just have one spine operation in your whole life, sometimes that's not the case. So what I tell people is that most people, I never see them again. They're good forever, for 10 years, long time. But there's a subset of people that just keep coming back. Did I explain it? Yeah. And some people can understand that. that. Some people can't, you know. Hmm. Also, also okay. some people like, yeah, if you do an operation and it doesn't, it, it doesn't work well. Like, it has a complication. Yeah, sure. You can't, you know, 100% right. Right. I mean, but you, the whole thing is complicated. Even figuring out what the thing, the strength is, one hundred percent of the time, what the precise shape of the thing is, right? You got no, no, you never know one hundred percent of the time because, <laughs> yeah, because multiple yeah. levels of disease. Right, right, you and so it. you use your judgment and you think what's the best. I always think of value. What's the best values procedure for this patient? Sometimes there's no surgery. Oh, like I see, like I see somebody who has like five bad discs. Hmm. Like, you don't, I mean, I don't think anything's going to work for you. You're just going to have to deal with it somehow. No surgery for you. But if there's something real focal that I can, like, swat like a fly, I mean, that, that's a good operation. Like, let's say a disc herniation that doesn't get better. Yeah, but sometimes you don't know because some people just say low back pain. And low back pain can be anything. It could be the facet. It could be a bad disc. It could be a sacroiliac joint. It could be pancreatitis. I mean, there's many things that it could be. That, that's a that's the hard part of spine is. That is that's the hard part of spine. Mm -hmm. I learned some things from the from your, your lecture that I wasn't able to attend last month about the the A A I screws and stuff. The, the Alar Alar screws. Alar iliac screws. Iliac screws, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think some new terminology, some new some new yeah. hardware. Yeah, you've got to do a fellowship now, I think. You have to go back to spot. <laughs> You'd be a good fellow. That's your next step. <laughs> well, uh, so any any other questions at all about spondylolisthesis? No, that was good. That was good. Thanks for